Greetings everyone, it's your local leather bedecked raccoon slayer here, with the first in my new series of rock and metal retrospectives, where I'll go over the full discographies of various bands and discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of what they have to offer. So without any further ado, let's talk about the glam metal behemoth, Motley Crue. But Slayer, why are you talking about a fucking hair band, you may ask? So what if the band looks like a certified freak show? It was the 80s. Get over it. And for the love of God, bad genres can have good bands. If you hate new metal but are willing to freak with the likes of Mudvayne, then you can certainly hate most hair metal and appreciate the gems that it gave us mainly from the first wave of 81 to 84. Motley Crue is part of that first wave, and as such, didn't succumb to many of the same tropes as Bon Jovi or Firehouse. So with that little preamble ramble out of the way, let's dive into the majestic decadence of Motley Crue. But I'm not going to be doing this retrospective alone. For today, I've decided to bring along Motley Crue aficionado and overall amazing friend of mine, Mosh Poss Wren. Thank you, Slayer. It's a pleasure to be a part of this video with you. Anyways, if you guys are curious about how Motley Crue started, and to learn about their first album, as well as some other ones I'll be talking about in this video, well, you came to the right possum. Now, for learning about the band and their origins, on how they became a band in the first place, I'd honestly would highly recommend watching the Dirt movie from 2019. If you have Netflix or any other alternative website in mind to watch it on, then I would just watch it there. Either that or just read the book. So yeah, let's get right into the start of their debut, or in other words, first album. For the hair metal heads, you probably already know what I'm about to discuss. But for those of you who don't know, I'm talking about their album called Too Fast For Love. While hair metal has its roots in bands such as Aerosmith or Kiss, and especially Van Halen's grandiose debut effort, it wasn't until about 81 or so when the genre truly came into its own. One of those codifiers of hair metal is, you guessed it, Motley Crue. Well, in terms of look at least, Too Fast For Love really doesn't classify as true hair metal to me much, if at all even. In fact, the album has a noticeable punk influence to it, with a dry, decidedly late 70s drum sound and overall gritty sound. So if your idea of hair bands is that they all produce an endless procession of bombastic ballads filled with more cheese than a Frenchman's bloodstream, I'd advise you take a listen to Too Fast for Love to lay those shallow observations to rest. With 900 copies pressed, the self-produced album was released on November 10th, 1981, and proudly boasted 10 tracks of raw aggression, attitude, and sleaze, which matched the hype of the band's already growing reputation. As a must-see act in clubs, Motley Crue carried over their badass demeanor seen on stage to after parties at the band's house, which was hardly furnished and saw the group living under harsh conditions. Even though they didn't have much money for food or anything else, booze and drugs were never short in supply. Then, living and loving the rock star life, crew set themselves up for one of the most legendary careers with Too Fast for Love. Hitting the studio, Vince Neil had only been in the band for a couple of days and had to read off of a lyric sheet while laying down his tracks on the band's Lether demo. With the urging of the band manager, Alan Kaufman, the band decided to release their first album entirely on their own since label interests had not yet mounted, partially because of their image, which can be seen on the album's cover. A homage to the Rolling Stones' artwork for their album, Sticky Fingers. As for my favorite tracks, I absolutely adore the speed metal majesty of Livewire, a track some of you might recognize from Tony Hawk's American Wasteland or Saints Row 3, the borderline punk rock of Too Fast for Love, and Take Me to the Top. An overall great debut for a legendary band, and arguably one of their best. The only problem I have is the production, a dual-edged sword in the fact that punk fans will like this album, but if you like morbidly overproduced Weenie Hut Jr. metal such as Bon Jovi or late 80s Def Leppard, you might want to look elsewhere. Anyways, in conclusion, the first album, Too Fast for Love, that Motley Crue produced is definitely one of their greatest albums they have in my opinion, and I'm sure a lot of crew heads can probably say the same thing. 
After a stunning debut effort, Motley Crue would follow that up with what many consider to be their best album ever, Shout at the Devil. And Slayer isn't wrong on that, actually. Honestly, I have to also agree with that as well. So Motley Crue's breakout second LP, 1983's Shout at the Devil, brought controversy and commercial success in equal measure. The album peaked at number 17 on the Billboard album chart, but also earned the scorn of Christian groups that interpreted the title as an endorsement of Satanism. Honestly, the title Shout at the Devil sounds more like a condemnation of Satan if you ask me. Now if the album was called something like Shout with the Devil, I could understand those accusations of Satanism somewhat, which apparently the band were originally going to name the album, believe it or not. Shout at the Devil originally had an even darker, if only slightly tweaked, title that reflected bassist Nikki Sixx's growing interest in satanic imagery. He wanted to call the record Shout with the Devil, Tom wrote in Motley Crue's 2001 autobiography, The Dirt. It was upsetting to label, and it was upsetting to me, Tom also added. By this point, Six was enamored with satanic symbols, like the pentagram that graces their eventual album cover. Controversy aside, Shout at the Devil features some of the best tunes of Motley Crue's career, from the pounding anthemic title track, Too Young to Fall in Love, which fellow gamers might recognize from GTA Vice City, which, getting off track here, was actually the game that got me into heavy metal in the first place. Thanks, Laszlo. And my absolute favorite track is Looks That Kill, with a badass riff that revs like a race car engine. I dare you to listen to this track without headbanging. It's impossible. When it comes to first wave hair metal, it doesn't get much better than Shot at the Devil. But as the mid-80s approached, hair metal would begin its slow descent into pop rock and cheesy ballads something that would eventually kill the genre by the turn of the 1990s. Which brings us to 1985's Theater of Pain. The Theater of Pain album is definitely something that changed Motley Crue's style of music to a more... pop-ish kind of sound with their current style of metal. As Motley Crue were unveiling their hotly anticipated third studio album in June of 1985, they were among the most notorious talked about bands in America. Though not necessarily for the right reason. It was their music. Instead, the LA band had spent much of the preceding six months dealing with singer Vince Neil's legal troubles, arising from the tragic car wreck that killed Hanoi Rocks' drummer, Nicholas Razzle Dingley, and left two others seriously wounded. But finally, with legal proceedings still pending and Neil out on bail, the album was delivered and the time had finally come for the tabloid chatter to stand back and let the music do the talking. But what would the music say exactly? Well, it was mixed messages. Theater of Pain was definitely released around that time that hair metal was going pop. I mean, it's always had the term pop metal thrown at it since early on, but hair metal come 1985 and 86 was really starting to cheese things up for an even bigger audience. Bon Jovi was starting to make the rounds during this time with a very pop-oriented version of hair metal that doesn't even classify as metal in the slightest, in my opinion. And Def Leppard were in the process of recording the most overproduced rock record of the entire 1980s. One of the hand riff centric headbangers like Louder Than Hell, Tonight We Need a Lover, Use It or Lose It, and Fight for Your Rights all harked back to Motley Crue's thoroughly metallic commercial breakthrough, Shout at the Devil. On the other, chorus driven rockers like City Boy Blues and Raise Your Hands to Rock aimed for greater accessibility and paved the way to a pair of crossover smash hits achieved through the band's faithful cover of Brownsville Nation's Smokin' in the Boys Room and the mega ballad Home Sweet Home. But if I had to choose a song that I really like out of this entire album, especially with a gun pointed to my head, I guess I'd say smoking in the boys' room. That's personally a song I could take or leave. The original wasn't that great in my opinion, and Crew's version is just alright. But taking center stage on this album is the hair metal ballad to end them all, Home Sweet Home. 
and would you believe that it's actually my favorite track on the album? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I got a soft spot for cheesy rock ballads like these, so I dig this track. But overall, Theater of Pain just isn't as good as the previous two efforts. 1987 would prove to be a landmark year for pop metal, with White Snake's self-titled, Def Leppard's Hysteria, Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, and of course, Motley Crue's Girls Times 3. On May 15th of 1987 is the fact that Motley Crue were able to record the album at all. Even though they resided in the comforts of multi-platinum megastardom, the band members were falling apart. Vocalist Vince Neil was trying to stay sober, but failing miserably, according to bassist Nikki Six in the band's memoir, The Dirt. Meanwhile, Six was addicted to heroin, drummer Tommy Lee was living with his future wife Heather Locklear at her estate, and trying to hide his rampant drug use and guitarist Mick Mars was suffering from ankylosing spondylitis, a chronic type of arthritis that left him in constant pain. Girls, Girls, Girls is an uneven effort for sure. Most of the songs are more blues-based than glam, revealing the band's Aerosmith influence over their fix for the suite. And the tracks are so highly polished they gleam. There's plenty of filler, including the short acoustic Nona, the piano ballad You're All I Need, and the live cover of Jailhouse Rock. But fans were so passionate about Motley Crue at that point, they overlooked the album's flaws. I think it's safe to say that the title track is the apex of frat boy hair metal anthems. It's the punching bag of the pedestrian casual wear bedecked alternative crowd even now. But while I could take or leave that track, it's far from the worst thing this genre shot out. Leave that to Firehouse and their 10,000 power ballads that all sound exactly alike. Thankfully, Crew made the wise decision to open this album up with the infectious melodic metal of Wildside, the creative peak of Ladies in Quantity of Three. Overall though, a lot of stuff on this album has a bluesy rock and roll aesthetic to it. Something that's very apparent by the inclusion of a weak sauce live cover of the subtly homoerotic Elvis classic, Jailhouse Rock. For whatever reason during the 80s, there was a small trend of metal acts covering oldie goldies and failing miserably at it. Whether it be Megadeth's cover of These Boots Were Made For Walking, or Judas Priest covering Johnny Be Good. Motorhead managed to make a stellar cover of Louie Louie, but first of all, it's Motorhead and almost everything they've made is gold, and two, Louie Louie is literally just three chords. Let's be honest, even a child could play that song. The disc debuted at number two on the Billboard album chart and eventually went quadruple platinum. And to this day, the two big hits remain staples of the band's live set. Now, in conclusion, as much as I enjoy at least some of the songs from the Girls, Girls, Girls album, I think a lot of the songs aren't really the best in my personal opinion. If you guys really want to know, the album itself has probably got to be the worst out of all their albums produced in the 80s. Sure, it has some catchy tunes and stuff, but a lot of it just had obvious and generic lyrics you'd always hear from like any other pop era of music. I mean, shit, for this album, you could pretty much say that it's literally just rock music with pop tied into it, and probably not even near as heavy as some of their earlier albums. It sounded good for its time, but I think as of now, it's just kind of bland and boring for some metalheads. But with the 80s drawing to a close and pop metal practically printing money by that point, the only question is if Motley Crue would triple down with even more ballads, or blend the best of both worlds and craft yet another masterpiece. Thankfully, by the time 1989 rolled around, Dr. Feelgood would come in to kickstart our hearts. What a fucking album, I tell ya. While in my opinion it still pales in comparison to the first couple of efforts, Dr. Feelgood was a damn good way to end out a decade of decadence. This album was actually their first sober album that they have recorded. Between the aftermath of Neil's crash and Six's death scare, reality finally started to kick in for Motley Crue. If they didn't get their shit together, their career would be over, and that they could end up dying permanently. So, the band cleaned up before getting into the studio and really channeled their energy into the music, which can obviously be heard. We've all heard Kickstart My Heart. For fuck's sake, it gets played on TV commercials, so even some of you poptimist teeny boppers have probably heard it before, but you've all heard it for a 
fucking reason. This is the definitive pop metal party anthem, and a song with a weirdly dark background to it. Nikki Six actually overdosed on heroin just two years prior to Dr. Feelgood, which briefly killed him. Yeah, that was before a doctor, presumably one with the last name Feelgood, pumped him with two full syringes of adrenaline, bringing the rocker back from the dead. Whatever you may think about Motley Crue, that is objectively one of the most metal things in the history of metal. Another fact is that it inspired Metallica. The reason why is because of Tommy Lee's stellar drum sound inspired Lars Ulrich to hire him to produce the Black Album. I find it highly ironic that a thrash metal titan like Metallica, who stood in brave defiance of the poppy glam metal of the mainstream, would eventually end up taking some slight influence from one of the figureheads of the glam metal genre. That aside, however much of a sellout move you think the Black Album is, it is objectively not a glam metal album, even if it is more puerile than the albums that preceded it. Back to Crew though. In conclusion, I'll say that this album was an absolutely great way to end the 80s altogether. I really love how this soundtrack sounded as well, and I have quite a lot of songs that I like from the soundtrack too. To be honest, my favorite song on the list would definitely have to be Dr. Feelgood because of the heaviness of how it sounds, as well as having the iconic music video that goes along with it. I mean like, damn. That song and music video was pretty fucking badass, and I think it did really well in my opinion. I also really like the song Kickstart My Heart, because it actually had a pretty good explanation of the band's struggles with addiction and Nikki Sixx's death experience, and for me, I thought it was rather interesting. So yeah, if you guys want their latest album of the 80s that actually sounds good, then I recommend giving the Dr. Feelgood album a listen. You won't regret listening to it, trust me on that. So many glam metal bands around this time were going full on pop, so to see Motley strike a perfect middle ground during that dark period of pop metal was a very satisfying thing to see, and a great way to end out the 80s. But as we all know, the world of metal was about to get a righteous kick in the groin straight out of Seattle. For better and for worse, we all know that as the alternative revolution. <sighs> Bring on the self-titled. Right from that painfully generic album cover that wouldn't feel out of place on a low-budget 90s hip-hop record, you know you're in for a bad ride. Countless metal acts in the heavy, thrash, and especially glam genre simply couldn't weather the alt-rock-dominated 90s without either breaking up or committing the ultimate sin of trying to fit in. Crew are no exception, as this is yet another metal band's half-hearted foray into the realm of grunge. So what did Motley Crue do for their next album? Find a new singer, of course. The parties disagree on how it happened, but in February of 1992, Vince Neil was out. Enter John Karabi, formerly of The Scream. And I'm not gonna lie, this album was an all-new low for Motley Crue. I mean, shit, they literally just called the album the same name as their band name. Which I am going to assume was inspired by 1991's self-titled by Metallica, you know, the one everyone refers to as the Black Album. I don't get why bands will name their fifth album in the same name as the band, because that would honestly make more sense if it was their debut. Then again, what do I know? I don't mess my brain up with every hardcore drug known to man. For me, it was kind of a lazy way so far as naming the album. Anyways, by the time Karabi joined the band, the pop-infused glam metal the crew perfected in the 1980s was long gone, replaced by the likes of more aggressive acts such as Pantera and gloomy Seattle-based bands like Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. These influences are all over the heavy groove-oriented sound of Motley Crue. Karabi was not even a crew fan before joining either, which helps explain the dramatic shift. The main problem with this album is that it just isn't Motley Crue. Don't get me wrong, it's not terrible per se, but hearing grunge coming from an album with Motley Crue on the label just hits you like a sack of bricks to the nads. I will say, Smoke in the Sky is a pretty good track on its own right, but most of this album just rubs me the wrong way. It hit the charts at number 7, then quickly faded. 
The concert halls got smaller and smaller before tours were canceled altogether. And the problem? Well, to answer that question is that it simply did not sound like Motley Crue, something the band considered a strength for some reason. And that wasn't what the fans wanted. In conclusion for this album, I honestly would say that it's not exactly the band's best album. It's just sort of like an album no one really cared to listen to or just even give a shit about it. Honestly, I wouldn't even blame those people for thinking that either, and I'll definitely have to agree. Grunge fans won't like it, and neither will hair metal fans. If you can ignore what band made this album, it's not completely terrible, just not very good. I would skip it if I were you, though. But the 90s still had more Motley Crue grunge in store, with Vince Neil back at the mic by the time 97's Generation Swine rolled around. Generation Swine. Need I say more? What a fucking pile this album is! Even a returning face can't save this horrible album. Generation Swine is commonly considered the worst Motley Crue album, and I might have to agree with that. At least the former album had the excuse of having a different lead singer who couldn't live up to expectations. Generation Swine is just a travesty, and might have been a contender for one of the worst metal albums of the 90s if it were actually metal. Instead, Generation Swine is pure, unadulterated alternative rock, and very bad alt-rock might I add. I understand alternative and grunge is somewhat of a pariah in the metal community for killing metal for most of the 90s, but I think most can agree that the big name 90s alternative acts were at least talented in their own terms. So this album was released on June 24th, 1997, and has got to be their worst album they've ever created of all time. Even after they got rid of John Karabi as their singer and brought Vince Neil back, it didn't really make much of a difference for this album, really. Even though this album found Motley Crue reuniting with their original singer Vince Neil after a five-year split, the problem was that they tinkered a bit too much with their original sound. Or, as Neil bluntly told Cleveland's The Plane dealer years later, it was a terrible record because there was too much experimenting. There's an old Kurt Cobain quote that I really think many metal bands during the 90s could have taken advice from. Trying to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. And I understand nobody wanted to hear fist-pumping hair metal anthems in the 90s, but there was actually another route bands like Motley Crue could have taken that might have saved them from complete irrelevance. A trip down 70s styled hard rock. Aerosmith did this in the 90s to great success, and many grunge acts such as Soundgarden and Pearl Jam took noticeable influence from the likes of Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. 70s rock was entering its permanent status as classic rock royalty at this point in time, and Motley Crue and other glam bands might have lessened their fall from grace had they taken this route instead. So, in conclusion for this album, there isn't really much to say other than that it was the band's worst album that they have ever produced of all time. For me, I didn't even care to even listen to the album at all because I don't want to make my ears bleed over the god-awful tracks and how the album sounds. I sadly have listened to parts of this album and I can safely say it is just as bad as people say it is. I think it's safe to say that this album is definitely not worth your time to be listening to it. Like I said earlier for the 1994 album, this album I would just skip by all means and just move on to the next album which happens to be a little better. Anyways, that's really about what all I've got to say on this abomination of an album. Thankfully, come the turn of the 2000s, the backlash against hair metal was starting to subside resulting in many acts of the genre launching comeback tours to decent success. And in that fateful year of 2000, Motley Crue would get a new tattoo. Now that's more like it. After two almost unlistenable albums, Crue finally released something that's decent. And thankfully, despite being released during the peak of new metal, that genre is absent from this album. What a good call. Can you just imagine new metal Motley Crue? I would rather eat a limp biscuit than hear that hypothetical version of new tattoo. The record is kind of, in my opinion, Motley Crue's most underrated record. An 11-track album that sees the band doing what they do best. 
and that's making rock and roll. As for this album, Vince Neil, Nikki Six, Mick Mars, and former Ozzy Osbourne drummer known as Randy Castillo, who replaced Tommy Lee, wanted to return to their roots and revive their old 80s sound. The band, who broke ties with Elektra Records to gain full ownership of their music, wanted to start the 21st century off with an album that would bring them back to the spotlight in a new way. New Tattoo begins with the song Hell on High Heels, featuring a typical 80s era McMars guitar riff with a touch of Zach Wilde squealing. New Tattoo is no masterpiece, but hearing Hell on High Heels right after cringing through Generation Swine was a breath of fresh air. Even the worst tracks on New Tattoo merely come across as generic. The album definitely is not the worst thing they have done, but it is not near what they did in their heyday. That being said, a crew fan just wanting to party and sit around drinking whiskey can enjoy this album, and it is generally fun to jam to when you want to kick back with some buddies. New Tattoo. Nobody's gonna say it's Motley's best, but after two albums of pure trite, it was a righteous return to form. And by 2008, Motley would release what is, as of now, their final album, Saints of Los Angeles. So now on to the final album, Saints of Los Angeles was released on June 24th of 2008. There's no question that Motley Crue are a lock for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's just simply a matter of time before they get a nomination. Motley Crue issued what would become their final studio effort in 2008. The album was Saints of Los Angeles, which was launched with the album title Song. The song was a catchy, contemporary rock song that was slick as black ice. Motley Crue toured extensively behind the album and even put together Crew Fest, which was held throughout North America with Buck Cherry, Papa Roach, and Nikki Six's then side project, which later turned into a full-time project, 6AM. The tour was a moderate success, but the album wasn't. Though that might have been due to the fact that by 2008, the music business was in a downward spiral, as fans didn't buy albums like they once did. Something that unfortunately would quickly instate a monocultural music landscape dominated by a ruling class of vapid pop songs that all sound alike and the half-hearted hipster apologist who defends said superfluous creations, but I've already ranted about that two years ago. Saints of Los Angeles is honestly a pretty good way to end things off. Considering that cringe-inducing concert from a few years back where Vince Neil sounds like a dying cat, I think this might be the best place to call it a day. That performance is one of the worst I have ever seen. Some people think that it's funny, but I just find it sad and cringeworthy. All in all, it wasn't the best record, but in the Motley Crue catalog, far better than Generation Swine, Girls, 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 and New Tattoo. Now you might be asking, yeah, but what about Theater of Pain? Well, in my opinion, that was a better album. That record featured hits such as Smokin' in the Boys' Room and Home Sweet Home. There were some better, deeper cuts that were great too, such as Keep Your Eye on the Money, Louder Than Hell, and City Boy Blues. In another 10 years, Saints of Los Angeles will be overlooked much like Van Halen's A Different Kind of Truth, Aerosmith's Just Push Play, Guns N' Roses' Chinese Democracy, and Kiss's Monster. Ah, uh, Chinese Democracy. That's like the Duke Nukem Forever of rock albums. Not nearly as bad as many people say, but after 15 long years in development, it certainly wasn't worth the wait. Why? Well, because they weren't that good. And it's not the records that people have a connection with or that people get nostalgic about. It's honestly kind of sad. Anyways, in conclusion for this last album for this retrospective, I'd say it's actually not a bad album in my opinion. The title track is a banger, as is Face Down in the Dirt. Sadly, the album does have some 2000s butt rock undertones, including some slight new metal influences on songs such as Motherfucker of the Year. Still, these songs aren't terrible if you can tolerate cheesy 2000s butt metal. 
In general, Saints of Los Angeles is an okay record with a mixture of good and mediocre tracks. At least this album and new tattoo were a bit better than the last two shitty albums. For my favorite songs on this album in particular, I guess I'll have to say the song Saints of Los Angeles, and that's about it. Honestly, for me, I'd say I'm more of a fan of their older stuff, not gonna lie, because their 80s stuff will always be very iconic and have a very special place in my heart. So that's really about all I have to say so far as this last album goes. So, to sum things up, Motley Crue aren't my favorite metal band. After all, I frequent the likes of speed and thrash metal, and even a lot of death metal too. So the hair metal stuff is more of a guilty pleasure more than anything, but those first couple of albums are pure gold. And even the hair metal albums from the late 80s curb stomp most of the competition in that genre. Also, for the summary on my part of this whole retrospective, if you guys are looking into getting into hair metal, Motley Crue would be a great starter band to listen to, in all honesty. I would definitely recommend listening to all of their 80s albums if you really want to get the hair metal or pop metal or rock feel. But after that, I would highly recommend just skipping those two shitty albums from 1994 and 1997 and basically just move on to their 2000s albums, which would be the last ones we've talked about. As for me, I will always love my Motley Crue, and will continue to be a fan until the day I fucking die. And if you guys are interested in checking me out, then feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I make all kinds of videos, from video edits with my OCs, commentaries, reactions, song covers, speed edit and drawing videos, and much more. And to top things off, she's made some great fan art for me, whether it be my persona or the rest of my crew from my webcomic Thrash Panda. So feel free to check that out and my lovely pal Rin over here while you're at it. So if you guys are into that kind of stuff, then don't hesitate to subscribe to me. You won't regret it, trust me. But that does it for this metal retrospective. Hopefully in the future I'll get to talk about some more pure metal bands in the speed, thrash, and extreme subgenres, and even some punk bands to add some spice. In the meantime, this is your local Trash Boy Slayer, signing off.